Good afternoon. I am Alma Hughes of the Federal Communication Commission, Consumer Affairs and Outreach Division. Welcome to today's webinar, Tis the Season to Be Jolly and Safe. During today's webinar, we will provide valuable consumer tips and best practices on how to be a consumer during the holiday season. Topics discussed will include robocalls, spoofing, and giving to charities. Our co-host today is the Federal Trade Commission. And now, I will turn the program over to today's moderator, Rebecca Lockhart. Thank you, Alma. And thank you all for being here. I'm joined by my colleague, Diana Coho, our co-host from the FTC, Colleen Tressler, and my other colleague, Celeste McRae. So the first topic we're going to go over is mobile device theft prevention. Celeste, could you please go over some tips to, some steps to prevent mobile device theft? Yes. Although mobile device theft has gone down in the recent years, we still have millions of Americans who are out there who fall victim of cell phone theft. So some of the suggestions that are made uh, to safeguard your cell phone would be to set a password. This could be through either a face recognition software, a pen, or your fingerprint. The next thing you need to do is um, record those special uh, serial numbers that are on the back of your battery. It's called the MEID, which is the Mobile Equipment ID, or your ESN number, which is Equipment uh, Serial Number. So those inf that information you need to take and a uh, place to decide uh, for later. Um, also, don't uninstall any uh, pre-located, pre I'm sorry, preloaded uh, devices, I'm sorry, preloaded apps that, are, are, that come with your phone that will help you to um, retrieve it at a later date. Okay. Well, when we're all out and about shopping with our phones in our hands, you see everyone with their phone out. What are just some common sense practices that we can do as consumers to prevent theft? Yes. Uh, the first thing is be aware of your surroundings. Um, don't use loud or annoying ringtones. Uh, don't leave your uh, phone unattended in a car or in a restaurant or like my son in the gym. Um, make sure that you don't lend your phone to strangers because they can just walk off with your device. Oh, yeah, those are some good tips. What, so what if the worst case scenario happens and you lose your phone or someone does steal it? What can consumers do next if that happens? Yes. Uh, well, the first thing they need to do is activate their device locator, um, and that will ping the phone as either lost or stolen. Then they need to contact the police because it is a crime, um, and don't try to retrieve your phone um, by yourself. Uh, the next thing you need to do is contact your wireless carrier, and they will um, deactivate your phone, um, which will help with unauthorized usage. And um, also, uh, those special numbers that I mentioned earlier, they can use those numbers to put it in a database that will let people know uh, that your phone is stolen. Okay. And could you go over just what the FCC is doing to raise awareness about this topic? Sure. Um, the FCC has a dedicated web page on mobile device theft. We have consumer guides, our web and print publishing division, along with our Office of Media Relations, um, often do uh, social media tweets and Facebook posts um, on various topics, including mobile device theft. Uh, we also uh, do presentations around the D.C. area and also webinars like this one today. Yes. So in addition to protecting our phones and our devices, iPads, whatever have you, uh, it's also important to protect the connection that you're using. Diana, could you go over what consumers should know about accessing Wi-Fi in public places? Sure. Like you were saying, it's so important not only to protect the device, but the connection to the device. So when you're out and about, it may seem convenient to do things online or use apps that are maybe active in certain stores, you definitely have to be careful and try not to get hacked. So one thing you can do is turn off any automatic settings that may be set in your phone to just 
access whatever the nearest Wi-Fi is that's available because if you're not sure what that is, you know, it could lead to problems. Another thing that you want to do is verify while you're in a store or a restaurant or some location that says, use our Wi-Fi, you know, while you're here. Well, go to an employee and show them what's coming up and make sure that you select something that's really um, valid and not something that maybe could cause problems down the road or get access into personal information. Another thing you can do is if you're purchasing something online while you're out through your phone, look for the HTTPS. So when you see that S, it means that the data is being encrypted. And lastly, if you're concerned about that and you have that option with your cell phone plan, you might want to actually just use your data plan and not purchase through Wi-Fi. So hopefully that will help. Yeah, those are some great tips. And Celeste, you talked a little bit about passwords. Uh, could you go over some tips to safeguard your passwords and why that's important? Sure. Um, safeguarding your password is important because, like Diana said, uh, public Wi-Fi access comes with risks and rewards. Uh, so the first thing you need to do is do not have the same password for multiple accounts because bad actors, if they access one account, they can access all of the accounts. Um, also, uh, make sure you don't uh, let the web browser uh, automatically save your password. Uh, just take time and just re-enter your password each time. And the last thing is do not have passwords that are easily guessed, like uh, password123 or your birthday. Um, just uh, try to have a combination of catchphrases or symbols, numbers, and uh, letters. Okay, thanks. Okay. Now, if only I could remember all my passwords. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Colleen, could you um, talk a little bit? I know a lot of us, when we're doing our holiday shopping, we just use mobile apps directly on our phones. Could you talk about uh, the privacy issues that go along with that? Right. A lot of these apps collect personal information, and you may think it's something as simple as your name, your address, your phone number, but really they can collect more personal information than that, like addresses, email addresses, age, birth dates, and so on. So you really want to take a close look at the privacy policy of these app providers. And you know, if it's not something that you're agreeable to, don't use that app. Maybe look for a different app. Some apps are free. Some cost money. Um, so you might want to take that into consideration as well. OK. Now we're going to move on to a topic that both our agencies know a lot about, and that is robocalls. Um, Diana, what are robocalls and why are they becoming such a problem? Robocalls are those annoying auto-dialed calls that you get and it's usually a pre-recorded or artificial voice. It can also include unwanted text to cell phones and it's more and more prevalent as it gets easier and easier for bad actors to basically create these calls and just push them out. So we've tried to keep up with the changes in technology and as soon as the rules go final and then they find a way around them and then we try to keep up again. So we recently did update them last month and we're making it easier for providers to try and um, take measures also. So you can ask your providers if there are things you can do. You can also um, opt out. You should be able to opt out and most of them do require some type of permissions. So just having a business relationship with a vendor is not a valid reason. And even if you did consent at one point, it's easy to change your mind. And if people don't leave you alone, write it down and file a complaint. Let us know. Okay, great. And what is spoofing and how is it related to scams? Spoofing is when somebody manipulates the number that comes up on your caller ID. So what the caller ID should do is reflect who's placing the call and then you can decide whether or not to pick up. But what happens is there's people that will do something so that it's either not the right person or it makes it look like someone that you could trust and they're trying to trick you into answering the phone so that maybe they could sell you something or get some type of personal information that could be used later maybe in ways that are not ethical. So um, for example, uh, mirror spoofing is a technique where the caller ID will show the, the number, actually your phone number 
And so people will think, what in the world? You know, who's calling? Who? This is my number. I'm not calling myself, right? And then that's when the game is on. So now they have a live person on the phone, and someone may try to convince you that you've won something or maybe that they're trying to help you out with some financial plan to consolidate bills and start trying to get credit card information. Or another one that happens this time of year is with utility companies. And that may not be mirror spoofing, but sometimes the caller ID will show, like a local oil company or gas company or something. So people pick up and think, wow, what's going on? And if it's a scammer, they may try to harass you or threaten you and say, like, if you don't pay this bill right away, you're going to lose service and then they'll say oh we could accept credit card payment and then they'll get your credit card information and that's when the problems occur so if you don't know who it is don't pick up and if you're not sure you can hang up at any time but um, if you think there could be something to it you can say you know I have to call you back and then independently verify the phone number of the service provider call them yourself and then find out what's what so those are some tips that can help you if you think you've been spooked. <laughs> yeah, I, I know I've picked up some of those calls because they can be very tricky. Is there anything else that consumers should do if they suspect that they have been spoofed? One thing you should do is try to take notes. Try to write everything down so you can report it to law enforcement, to us, to federal trade. Another thing that you should definitely do is keep an eye on your bills, and particularly any bills that might involve any accounts that came up during the conversation, because if there's some way they were able to get information and then you could start seeing unwanted charges on your bills, you'd want to be aware of that and report that too. Yes. Well, as we know, the holiday time is a season for giving as well, and not everyone is bad. So, uh, Colleen, could you tell us a little bit more about before giving to a charity? Absolutely. So we know this time of year, the solicitations really roll in, and we have some tips to help people decide where they want to give and through what means. So the first thing we always tell people is to donate to charities you know and trust and have a proven track record. Um, on our website at consumer.ftc.gov, we actually tell people to check out the charity with organizations like the Better Business Bureau's Wide Wise Giving Alliance, Charity Navigator, Charity Watch, and GuideStar. And we do provide links to those organizations on our site. Um, the other thing we tell people, if you really want to donate um, some of these calls are coming from the charities themselves, but other charities may be hiring paid fundraisers. And of course, those paid fundraisers have to get paid. So where do those payments come from? It comes from your donations. Um, some paid fundraisers get as much as 50% of your paid donation um, as part of their payment. So what we recommend is if you want to ensure that more like 100% of your donation goes to the charity, just, you know, pay by credit card directly to the charity, write a check, and so on. And I know that FTC has a lot of great resources on other holiday topics, such as Don't Let Scammers Take Away Your Holiday Cheer, and a brand new blog that you guys just put out uh, on holiday shopping tips. So is there anything you want to say about those? Right. So the holiday shopping tips is um, front and center at consumer.ftc.gov. So you'll see the full list there. But just um, some of the, the common sense things that we always tell people is, you know, make a budget. Um, you may think it's just going to be for um, presents and meals and that type of thing, but incidentals always come up. Impulse purchases always come up as you're checking out. You're in the holiday spirit. You say, oh, that would be cute for somebody, but you really need to stick to a budget. Um, the other thing is um, there are resources to do online comparisons. Um, and one thing we are aware of at the FTC is that you want to be careful about what other people say about products and services. Um, if there are reviews, you really want to check multiple sources. Um, we have had instances where people have been tied to products and services and they're getting paid. Um, if they are getting paid to endorse or promote a product, it has to be stated as such. So it's plain right there for you. Um, the other thing we want to make sure people know is if you use a mobile device or a computer um, to shop for deals, you might get unexpected emails or texts, and these may actually be leading to fraudulent websites. 
once you said about people trying to get personal information, credit card information, and so on. So we really encourage people to um, know, use sites that they know and trust, just like when you um, donate to charities. Great, yeah, those are some great things to keep in mind, especially that budget. Uh, <laughs> I always seem to find something that I need as well. Um, is there anything else that you all would to share, any last holiday tips or anything you forgot to mention while you were going over our topics? Sure. Basically, again, with the robocalls or the spoofing, try not to answer. If you do answer and you're not sure what's going on, hang up. But another thing I forgot to mention is you might hear something like to stop getting calls like this in the future, press one. And basically, you don't want to do that either because what's happening is that you're verifying that someone's home at that time. So it could actually lead to more calls at that time. And they target people, especially like older Americans too, that especially on the landlines, they're more likely to be at home and they're more likely to answer and then they're more likely to start talking. So there's, there's a lot behind this that can be very unscrupulous and you just wanna to try to limit the contact as much as possible. But again, if, if anything does happen and you, you wanna report it, you know, help us help you. So let us know and let us know what's going on and record everything, the date, the time, what went on, and, and we're gonna try and stop it as best we can. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the FCC also recently put out a consumer alert uh, called Beware of Holiday Season Phone Scams. So that's gonna be on our event page and you can find it on our website as well. And we also have a message from Chairman Pai on robocalls and spoofing that just kinda of drives home all these points that we've gone over. So take a look at this message from our chairman. Well, robocalls and spoofed caller ID are too often used to scam consumers. Consumers shouldn't answer the phone if they aren't sure of who is calling. Legitimate callers, of course, will leave you a voicemail if they want to. If you do answer a call, don't give out any personal information. Some scam callers often try to scare consumers into giving them money, often via gift cards. Law enforcement and government agencies will never ask you to make a payment through a wire transfer or with a gift card. If someone calls you claiming to be your utility, just tell them you'll call them back. Look up their number on a legitimate website or a bill and use that number to contact them. And file a complaint at FCC.gov. Complaints matter. We use them to help catch those who break the law, and they're important in helping us to update our policies to make sure that we have the rules in place to go after these robocalls before they're unleashed. Well, thank you all for joining me and sharing all these wonderful consumer tips. Uh, we hope that everyone out there heard something that will help them along the way. Um, we want to share our event page with you. At, uh, we'll show a list of links that you guys can access. Um, and this is also links to the FTC consumer page where you can go and sign up for those consumer scams, as well as our FCC consumer page, which also has a link to our complaint portal. And just the event page at the top is where you can find all the resources. There'll be a archived video of this event. And at any time, if you have any questions, we weren't able to take live questions today, but if you have any questions, you can reach us here at outreach at FCC.gov or Colleen directly at the FTC at ctrestler at FTC.gov. And thank you all, and we hope you have a jolly and safe holiday.